Welcome to Game Honest, this weekly, your one-stop shop for video game news, keeping up with the biggest stories so you don't have to. I'm your host, Janet Garcia, and today we're talking about PlayStation. We had PSVR 2 confirmed, we had the State of Play, we had Pokemon's 25th anniversary celebration, all of that, and a whole lot more. As usual, we'll be kicking it off with our main stories, and I will dig into the State of Play as well as the Pokemon presentation after all the other main topics were out of the way. But we still have a bunch of PlayStation updates outside of the state of play, starting with more PlayStation exclusives coming to PC. And just to get ahead of things, basically all these PlayStation stories come from an amazing interview that Jim Ryan did with GQ, and we got just a bunch of information. It was kind of wild how much Sony essentially had up their sleeves to just roll out, and it has me really excited about what 2021 looks like. But again, bringing it back to the story at hand, these can be sort of broken out and they were broken out in the form of different posts on the PlayStation blog too, so that's another way that you can consume that information in a text-based fashion. But we have more PlayStation exclusives are coming to PC, and we know from that interview that a whole slate of them is on the way, starting with Days Gone this spring. Essentially, Jim Ryan was asked what changed about PlayStation's feelings of having their games on PC, and he had this to say. I think a few things changed. We find ourselves now in early 2021 with our development studios and the games that they make in better shape than they've ever been before. Particularly from the latter half of the PS4 cycle, our studios made some wonderful, great games. There's an opportunity to expose those great games to a wider audience and recognize the economics of game development, which are not always straightforward. The cost of making games goes up with each cycle, as the caliber of the IP has improved. Also, our ease of making it available to non-console owners has grown, so it's a fairly straightforward decision for us to make. He was also asked how putting Horizon Zero Dawn on PC essentially went, and he had this to say. We assess the exercise in two ways. Firstly, in terms of the straightforward success of the activity of publishing the game on PC. People liked it, and they bought it. We also looked at it through the lens of what the PlayStation community thought about it. There was no massive adverse reaction to it, so we will continue to take mission steps in this direction. So essentially, it all boiled down to the money. It's usually about the money because games are a business. I've said that a couple times on this show, and I will continue to say that as much as we love them, and it is this amazing expression of art. It is a business, and it needs to make money. So I think this is a totally fine move for PlayStation. Essentially, I think PC and console are just two completely different animals. I am someone that owns a PC, but personally, I just love consoles. I'll play basically everything on a console if I can. It also seems like this isn't going to be a one-to-one. I would be pretty surprised if we ever see, like, a PlayStation exclusive game. Well, I guess it wouldn't be exclusive, but a PlayStation game come out immediately on PS5 and on PC. I don't think we're going to end up seeing that. I feel like their IPs are their big strength. So it's like, why not get double the value out of it, essentially? Not literally one-to-one, because that's not how the numbers necessarily break down. But it's like, you can get all of this money for Horizon Zero Dawn 2, for example. This is me kind of just presuming it on PlayStation 5, and then maybe a few months, even a few years later, putting it to PC, and it's just extra money. You already did the work of making the game. You've already sold it on one platform. Obviously, it takes more than just, like, dragging and dropping it over, but Jim Ryan himself mentioned that part of the reason they're doing this is because it's become a lot easier to put it onto that platform. So yeah, I'm cool with this. I got no problem with it. I find it kind of funny that Days Gone is, like, the next frontier for this, Days Gone's an interesting one. It wasn't really very critically acclaimed. I personally wasn't a big fan of it, but it's getting a lot of attention. I mean, it got the next gen update. Now it's getting this port. Um, I think I think we're going to see a Days Gone 2. I would be kind of surprised if we didn't end up seeing them continue with the franchise. And personally, I kind of want them to continue with it because I think they did have some good ideas. It just was way too long. I didn't even finish it. It was too long. And uh, it definitely was lacking in a couple different areas, but... I don't know, I'm getting a sense that we are continuing to see Days Gone, so I feel like we'll see Days Gone in the future. Last April, PlayStation launched the Play at Home initiative, which was offering free games to sort of make the COVID situation that year a little easier, and now it is kicking back off in March and extending through June, which also tells me that PlayStation thinks the pandemic's gonna be definitely in full swing until June. That's like the vibe I get from that, right? And hey, that is probably pretty realistic at this point. I think it's going to be a while until things are back to normal but until things are hey free games yay free games we're starting off in march 1st which if you're listening to this now uh it's already the first or the second because i put this out a little bit late so you can already pick this up 
PlayStation and Insomniac Games will make Ratchet and Clank PS4 available for free download for a limited time through the PlayStation Store. So go ahead and download that if you do not already own that game, which is also, again, good marketing for what they have coming up next. Ratchet and Clank is also a series that's getting a lot of attention right now. And once you redeem it, it's yours to keep. You don't have to worry about them taking it away or anything. It's yours forever. Just go on. It's totally free. And on March 25th, Funimation is kicking in a very special offer of extended access to new subscribers to Funimation or Wakanim? Wakanim? That's probably not said correctly. In the countries, they are available. And it just goes on to explain the breakdown of what Funimation is, and that will be available for a limited time. Also related to Play at Home, during that GQ interview, Jim Ryan was asked about, hey, you're... For Play at Home, mostly it's old games, but for PlayStation Plus, we've been seeing some new games also pop in, which is, again... PlayStation's online service, you get free games every month, oftentimes they're old, but lately they've been they've been new, they've been more recent, stuff like Destruction All-Stars, stuff like Bug Snacks. And Jim Ryan was asked if we're gonna see more of this, and he said, yes, it will continue. We see this as a very interesting and innovative way to publish games and make games available to our subscribers. It works for us as the publisher, and we know that subscribers to PlayStation Plus love it. That's something I'm really excited about too. I feel like PlayStation Plus has really been hitting lately. We've gotten a really strong lineup of games, and I'm excited to see what the next thing that PlayStation's putting on my radar. I also kind of like it as sort of this almost curation of what games they have available on their console. Because for the most part, they're picking, when especially when it's newer stuff, I feel like they're picking stuff that they either definitely want a lot of people to play or they think will have a chance of really gaining traction. And the last really big thing to come out of this interview, and again, this is also on a PlayStation blog post, PSVR 2 is happening. It's gonna be a thing. I am so excited about this. Here's what we know so far. We know that it won't be coming out this year, but we do know that dev kits have been sent out there will be a single cable and there will be a new VR controller that will incorporate some of the key features found in the DualSense wireless controller. This is awesome. I love this. I'm a big fan of VR. I owned a PSVR. I still own a PSVR actually. I also have an Oculus Quest. Uh, admittedly, I have not played as many VR games as I would like to. It is, you know, it's difficult to make the time, but I am so excited about that space and I've always loved that PlayStation occupied that space from a console perspective. We don't see that a lot. We actually don't see that at all anywhere else. And when asked about why pursuing this, Jim Ryan basically said, we believe in VR, and then just kind of went on to talk about the ethos of the company. And one thing that I liked that he mentioned was, we like to innovate. I turn around the question and say, why not? And I just think that's awesome. I want to see VR be more mainstream in general. And, and another thing that Jim Ryan had pointed out was that one in four of those who bought a PS5 did not have a PS4 or do not have a PS4, which is wild. Can you imagine being someone who put in all of that effort to jump in on PlayStation? Like, I'm not, you know, judging that or saying that's like a negative thing or a weird thing. It's just, I think it really speaks to the power that PlayStation has right now because so many people had a PS4. So to be the person that didn't have a PS4, but put in all of the effort to get a PS5 and have that be essentially 25% of PS5 owners. That also means you probably didn't have or experience PSVR because that only worked on the PS4. So I think the fact that they're doing PSVR 2 has a bunch of potential, especially with it being only one wire. And I know people were disappointed that it has a wire at all. And I also was really hoping they'd go wireless. But to be honest, one wire, that's not bad at all. I'll take the one wire. We'll see how I actually feel when I get ha my hands on the system or the peripheral, however you want to phrase it. It is kind of funny that they have PSVR because I went through that whole thing to get that like free little adapter thing. And now I'm like, well, I'm definitely not going to use this. I'm just going to wait for PSVR 2 or whatever they're going to end up calling it to come out. Speaking of VR, you can now activate Quest voice commands hands-free, but you have to say, hey, Facebook. This comes from Ben Lang over at Road to VR, who spotted the Oculus blog post saying it's adding a wake phrase to the Quest voice commands, making it easy to get the headset to listen, whether you're using controllers or hand-free tracking, but the company settled on a seemingly odd choice, hey, Facebook, though we all know that choice isn't exactly so odd given the fact that Facebook now owns Oculus. Uh, I think that's another thing when we're talking about this VR conversation, I absolutely love the Oculus Quest. I don't, I don't necessarily love the fact that it's owned by Facebook. And I know people have already complained that you need a Facebook account to sign up for your Oculus Quest and to use your Oculus Quest essentially. And I'm kind of just rolling with it. Like I already have a Facebook account. I know I'm probably gonna always have a Facebook account even if I don't use it that much. And I do love my Oculus, but stuff like this is exactly why people were like, oh, Facebook bought Oculus. Like 
time to throw this thing out the window, which, hey, that works to Sony's potential benefit. That kind of thing isn't going to happen with PSVR 2, but I will still have that cable, so it kind of is what it is. Speaking of things that just are what they are, Stadia is hit with a class action lawsuit for failing to deliver its promised native 4K gameplay. This comes from Nathan Birch over at WCCF Tech. And I'm just going to read directly from this piece where it states, Jacqueline Shepard has filed a class action lawsuit in Queens County, New York, which primarily focuses on Google's pre-release promises that Stadia is more powerful than both Xbox One X and PlayStation 4 Pro combined and will provide ultra fast, high quality 4K 60 frames per second resolution gaming. Doom Eternal Publishers, its software, and Destiny 2 Publisher are also singled out for making similar claims. Both games would end up running at 1080-60 or upscaled 2160-30 on Stadia. The lawsuit, which is over 40 pages long, also accuses Google of misrepresenting the value of Stadia Founders Edition packages, amongst other complaints. And we've seen a lot of different lawsuits hit in the gaming space lately. Certainly, this is just more bad news for Google Stadia, which is already not having a very good time with having shut down their studio. I do think we're very much in the beginning of the end of Google Stadia. And it's too soon to say what the impact of this specific lawsuit is going to be on the company. But I think it's stuff like this that is going to make Google say, you know what, this is just like not worth it. And for more bad signs, we have Kirk McKeon's reporting over at The Gamer, which headlines Techland is bleeding talent due to autocratic management, bad feedback and lack of direction behind the scenes of the studio making Dying Light 2. And I love that this just opens with it's shit. Like, that's the first line in it. Uh, Let me actually just read this first sentence. It's shit. That's the kind of feedback developers at Techland get from their leaders, the inner circle around CEO Powell Marchiqua. Interviews with 10 current and former Techland staff, all of whom requested anonymity so as to not risk their careers, depict the studio marred by autocratic management, poor planning, and toxic work culture that trickles down from the top. As one source claims, the fish rots from the head. And what's interesting, but also kind of sad, I guess, and disheartening about the situation is I feel like I've read this report before. On this show, I've talked a lot about these situations and folks reporting on what's going on behind the scenes at studios and what kind of toxicity comes to play. You know, I can't help but think of Rebecca Valentine's recent reporting from the studio making season. And so much of this reads the same in inappropriate comments going unchecked, in the fact that Techland's CEO's wife is essentially the acting chief HR officer, which seems like that probably shouldn't be the case. And just generally, this report is just riddled with examples and situations and ways that this is sort of, I guess, eating the studio from within. I really encourage you to read it. There's a lot of sad but important details in it. It's super thorough. And on that note, I'm just going to end with reading out the final paragraph of the report. The result of all this is a team of hardworking, talented people who are being slowly drained of any enthusiasm. The amount of passionate people and talent you can meet in Techland is overwhelming, one source tells me, and it's a sentiment reflected by everyone I speak to. I'm talking mostly about the regular staff here, since leads seem to be really burned out and tired. Sometimes it even feels that they don't care anymore. They will do whatever the CEO tells them in order to keep their position in the company safe. It is very sad to see this enthusiasm and potential being wasted. And unfortunately, I think this is a story we'll see again and again in this space. PlayStation is winding down Sony Japan Studio. This was originally reported by Video Games Chronicle by Andy Robinson and Alex Calvin. And this is the developer behind Ape Escape, Gravity Rush, and Knack. Sony Interactive Entertainment later sent VGC a statement confirming that what remains of Japan's studio will be absorbed into Team Asobi, as per their report. The statement reads as follows. In an effort to further strengthen business operations, SIE can confirm PlayStation Studios Japan Studio will be reorganized into a new organization on April 1st. Japan Studio will be recentered to Team Asobi, the creative team behind Astro's Playroom, allowing the team to focus on a single vision and build on the popularity of Astro's Playroom. In addition, the roles of external production, software localization, and IP management of Japan Studio titles will be concentrated within the global functions of PlayStation Studios. And it is worth noting that VGC said people with knowledge of the matter told VGC that Sony Japan Studio simply hasn't been profitable enough in recent years. The developer wants to create games that appeal to the Japanese market first in the hopes of having global appeal, while PlayStation wants the kind of global hits that its other first party studios produce. Again, as with most things, it comes down to money. As far as staffing details, this comes from VGC saying, Some Japan Studio staff will join Asobi, we were told, while others have followed Silent Hill and Gravity Rush director Kichiro Toyama 
who left Japan studio last year to his new studio, Boca. Again, pronunciations might be a smidge off. They also wrote, it's not entirely clear if the restructure has affected the studio's external development department, which collaborated on games such as last year's Demon Souls, but one person VGC spoke to suggested it would continue. Hopefully this works out for the devs. I do love Team Asobi, like I loved Astro's Playroom, and I hope we get more Astro. So hopefully good things come of this for everyone involved. And in some ways continuing with that story, over at Kotaku, Bloodborne producer Masaki Yamagiwa is leaving Sony. This is something Yamagiwa announced on Twitter, saying, I'm leaving Sony Entertainment at the end of the month. I'm going to continue working hard on creating games. Many thanks to everyone. And it's worth noting that Yamagiwa produced titles such as Bloodborne, Bloodborne, The Old Hunters, Darasign, or Darasign, and Tokyo Jungle. So yes, lots of changes. This one's a bit of an odd one. Konami is turning Frogger into a game show. This comes over from Michael McWhorter over at Polygon. NBC's Peacock gives Frogger the green light, ha 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 ha, for 13 episode series. It will have 12 themed obstacle courses, including the treacherous traffic. Contestants will also have to leap over snapping gators and hop over hungry hippos to conquer the course. So basically it's like a competitive, like physical, goofy situation set in the whimsical Frogger world. I really wanna watch this, but also it's on Peacock, so I don't, I feel like I, that probably won't end up happening, but I'm, I'm very curious as to how this is gonna pan out. And then just a quick update slash PSA, there will be a Super Smash Bros. Ultimate DLC presentation happening on March 4th, showcasing Pyra and Mithra. It's happening at 6 a.m. PT, so get up early if you're interested in checking out those details. Moving on to awards and accolades, Good Games Writing has released their nominees for Best of 2020. This is a group that highlights the best games-related writing. And they have really cool stuff like best list, best feature, like best criticism, and a whole bunch of other categories. They have their nominees already up. They've started announcing winners. So go ahead and head to their Twitter, which is at GoodWritingVG, if you're interested in checking out those lists in detail. Their mission statement essentially reads as follows, recognizing great video gaming, content, developing talent, and otherwise changing the discourse in all we do. The nominations are really cool. I've seen a lot of writers that I recognize. I'm excited by the names that I don't recognize because that means I potentially have a new writer that I should be following and keeping track of and checking out their work. So yeah, I recommend going to there and seeing who got nominated because you might discover a new favorite writer. All right, let's finally talk Sony State of Play. As usual, I did my bingo card for this. I did not get bingo, unfortunately. One day, one day I'll get the bingo, but here is a summary of everything that we saw at Sony State of Play, which again was approximately a 30 minute long stream. Crash 4 is getting a next gen update, which normally wouldn't mean a whole lot because it's kind of a, essentially a cartoon graphics, but those low screens were really brutal, so I am excited about that. We saw more Returnal gameplay, this time highlighting the roguelike elements that are in the game, which I am sort of mixed on, and I don't know if the combat's really for me, but I did like the world building they did in it, so definitely check that out. I am excited to play that game when it comes out. Knockout City is having a beta on PS4. I believe that's happening in April and it'll be a cross-play one. Also, Knockout City showed a lot better in my opinion in this showcase. It was a lot more highlighted on gameplay and what's actually going on versus the look at Knockout City that we got in the Nintendo Direct was a lot more jokey and like meant to be personable, but I just was sort of confused. I found it a little bit off-putting as well, like it wasn't informative or charming. Here, I think it looked a lot better, so check that out. Sifu was announced for PS5. It's gonna be out in 2021. Essentially, it's like a brawler, martial arts style fighting game, but with a, a bit more of I guess, an adventure twist to it with the way it was sort of presented, but not a whole lot of details there, but it was really cool to see a new game. We got another look at Solar Ash, which is now confirmed for 2021. That is, again, the game made by Heart Machine, the folks that made Hyper Light Drifter and is published by Annapurna Interactive, so you already know I gotta check it out. And that'll be on PS4 and PS5. We got a look at Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, which is gonna be out this year. Another look at Oddworld Soulstorm. This has been shown a lot of times, still out April 6th, so just more, more of the same. Though it is worth noting that it will be PS Plus in April, which is really cool. And again, another example of PS Plus being kind of like the hot place to get games right now. Kina Bridge of Spirits finally has release date. It's August 24th. I'm very excited about this game. This is one of my most anticipated games of the year. It has a really beautiful art style. It looks very cinematic, like a Disney film of some kind. 
Really, really cool stuff. Hopefully that one's awesome. We got another look at Deathloop, which was, you know, kind of more of the same. I do think this one was a little bit more action oriented than previous trailers had been. And reminder that that's coming out on May 21st. And the big finale piece was Final Fantasy VII Remake, a next gen update, but also DLC called Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrate coming out June 10th for PS5. It's going to feature Yuffie. That doesn't really mean anything to me. I did play Final Fantasy VII Remake, but I don't, that doesn't click for me though. It does for fans, which is cool. Again, it's sort of in an odd position of just jumping into it. It doesn't really do a lot to onboard you. But a lot of people have been looking forward to an next gen update. And that's pretty cool. It was already a gorgeous looking game, so it'll just look a little bit better on PS5. And that FF7 Remake PS5 upgrade will be free for those who own the game on PS4. Overall, I was cool with this. It didn't have anything mind blowing, but pretty much everything I saw, I was like, well, okay, yeah, I can get with that. I will say my number one critique of this is it didn't really have like a big punch at the end. I know that there are probably people who love Final Fantasy VII and love the remake. And for them, that DLC was like a, a big, amazing moment. But even that, I'm kind of like, it, is it? You know, like I think the DLC can be cool. And I've spoken to people who are excited about it. Actually, you can check me out on Min Max. I'll link it in the episode description, the YouTube description. But I jumped on there to do uh, a deeper conversation on the state of play, if you're interested in that. And uh, some folks on there were really excited about it. But it just didn't have like a big wow factor at the end for me. As for things that did have that wow factor, the Pokemon presentation was pretty good, which was really impressive because it was the only presentation that's happened in the last month that I didn't have any expectations for and I didn't need them to do anything. It was to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Pokemon. So I'm like, okay, this is your party. You can just hang out and, and show me some like plushies or, you know, a sizzle reel of you throughout the years. And that would have been enough, but we got so much more than that. As folks expected, we got another trailer for Pokemon Snap, which again comes out on April 30th. It looks great. It's awesome. It showed off some new features, uh, the photo editing modes and things like that. Talked about sharing your pictures and voting on them as a community and all of that. I'm excited for that. And it finally happened. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl are getting remakes. They are called Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. The art's pretty interesting because it sort of is in a way in that Let's Go style, but it also has like that DS vibe to it when you're like walking around the world. I personally think it looks really cute. I feel like people were maybe in some circles mixed, but I think it looks pretty good. And I'm really excited because I've never played Diamond and Pearl and Diamond and Pearl and Heart Gold Soul Silver are like the games folks keep mentioning when we talk about the best Pokemon games ever. So I'm excited. Open world Pokemon is happening. It is called Pokemon Legends Arceus and it will be coming out in early 2022. It looks fine. Like it's way too early to, in my opinion, to put any weight on this. Everyone was talking about this as we're finally getting the Pokemon game we've always wanted for years like it's finally happening this time it's for real but we said that with Sword and Shield and even though Sword and Shield is a game I absolutely love so far it is my favorite Pokemon game that I've personally played and I have not played them all but I just think it's too soon to say that this is gonna be you know we, we didn't really see a whole lot of it yet um, and of course you never know until you play it I think it, I think the idea seems really cool I'm hoping they have some really interesting sim elements with like the town you stay at and and how you adventure in things but you know the idea of sort of doing the first Pokedex for this region and kind of starting this off I think it's a really fun refreshing angle for the series I am looking for things to sort of shake things up like I liked with Sun and Moon how they like took away traditional gym battles and things like that so I'm looking forward to seeing what this line of experimentation yields for them. But I also can't help but think this is so soon after Sword and Shield, especially when you count the DLC that we got for Sword and Shield. And I just really wish the team had a little bit more time to spend between projects. I'm, I'm not ready to feel like I'm in tears with like Arceus's announcement or anything like that personally. Cool concept, looking forward to learning more. But one thing I will say is this was a great presentation. I had no complaints um, and I'm shocked because I didn't, again, I didn't think they needed to come with anything, but they came with a lot. And now on to game delays. Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 is delayed until sometime after 2021. And here is the official statement. It says, good morning, everyone. As you have noticed, we've been keeping pretty quiet for a while. With this in mind, the first piece of news we have for you is to confirm that Bloodlines 2 is still in development. Secondly, we have made the hard decision that Hard Suit Labs will no longer be leading the development of Bloodlines 2, which also means that we will not be releasing in 2021 as previously planned. 
And they go on to just kind of talk about that, thank the studio for their time. This is a pretty wild pivot to be making. And I think it's gonna be a real long time now before we see Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlands 2. Next up, Gran Turismo has also been delayed. This is again backtracking over to that interview with GQ. And this is now delayed into 2022. For game events, releases, and updates, we got a lot of stuff. Stonefly is a game that's getting a lot of attention. It is a tranquil action adventure game. It's gonna be for PS5, Xbox Series X slash S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. It's from the creators of Creature in the Well. The release window is summer 2021. Several outlets have covered this. A lot of people are saying it seems pretty good. They've liked what they've seen so far. And here is the game description on Steam. Harness the wind and soar through the wilderness of Stonefly. Brilliant but naive inventor Annika Stonefly must recover a lost family heirloom using her smarts and strategy. Glide strategically among flora and fauna, confronting hungry bugs, adventures, and memorable characters. Along the way, you'll unravel a heartwarming story of self-discovery, family, legacy, and belonging. Roots of Pacha is a prehistoric farming sim that is aiming to come out in 2022 on Switch and PC. This is highlighted by Jordan DeVore over at Destructoid with the tagline, one to watch for Stardew Valley fans. It looks adorable. Like I love this art style. It's super cute. I love just like farm sim or any, any sim animals kind of instantly win me over. So this one definitely looks interesting. Keep an eye out. Monster Hunter Rise is coming to PC in 2022, so that was going to be, or currently is a Switch exclusive. But if you don't have a Switch and you're like, oh, I'm gonna miss out on Monster Hunter, don't worry, you it will be there in 2022. Watch Dogs Legion Online Co-op is coming out March 9th. Cuphead and Mugman are coming to Fall Guys. Anthem, we were talking last week about what's gonna happen with Anthem, what's the update, where are they gonna decide? Unfortunately, shocking probably no one, they have made the, quote, difficult decision to stop development work on Anthem, aka Anthem Next but they will continue to keep the Anthem live service running as it exists today. This came via an update post on Bioware's website. And one note it ends on is game development is hard. True. Decisions like these are not easy. Moving forward, we need to laser focus our efforts as a studio and strengthen the next Dragon Age and Mass Effect titles while continuing to provide quality updates to Star Wars The Old Republic. So, you know, it's sad when things end, but those are franchises that probably are worth investing the time in. Like that sounds a lot more appealing admittedly than trying to reconfigure Anthem. And I'm guessing they looked at it and, and figured the ROI on that is way higher than digging their heels into Anthem next. On a lighter note, Tony Hawk's getting a next gen upgrade. So there you go. Oh, but it does cost money, which is weird. Like if you own the digital deluxe edition already, it's essentially free, but if not, you'll have to pay $10 to upgrade to unlock the cross-gen deluxe bundle. And for some reason, if you have a disc version on Xbox, you can't do the upgrade at all, even if you pay. It's very complicated. It's just another, it's another bad complicated situation. I can't imagine even paying the regular price for a Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 bundle, which I know will get some people mad. So I can't, can't take the further step to imagine paying an additional $10 for it to run a little bit better. Like, no. And if you haven't gotten to Tony Hawk yet because you have a Nintendo Switch, good news. Tony Hawk is coming to Nintendo Switch. Next up, this Animal Crossing Sanrio Amiibo card crossover thing. It's legit. I kind of need it now. And I'm really surprised because I don't care about Sanrio characters at all. So this is an update coming in March. Uh, I believe I touched on this before because it was already announced. But we have a few more details. The packs come to the United States on the 26th of March is exclusively at Target. And the real big deal here is you get like these different outfits, but you can also get like these like Sanrio, like these different villagers. Uh, the residents are Chelsea, Chai, Etoile, I might be saying that wrong, Marty, Rhea, and Toby, and they have like these different furniture sets, and some of the furniture sets are like really cute, like I just, I need to have this, and I think it's gonna be really hard to get, so uh, wish me luck if you're trying to get this, good luck to you as well, because it's gonna be rough. Another game highlighted by Destructor, this one is highlighted by Chris Carter, shout out to Chris, Chris is really cool, Wind Peaks is Where is Waldo meets Gravity Falls, and it's coming to Switch. That's how he sort of couches this via his headline. And it's out March 3rd, so if you're listening to this when it comes out, it's either about to be out or is already out. And apparently this is a game that actually came out mid-2020 on PC. So it's already kind of a known quantity in that sense, which is cool if you're on the fence about it because then you can kind of look into it a bit. The art style looks super charming. I really have been enjoying these sort of finding games I played Hidden Folks and I love that. So I'm definitely interested in this. 
Destruction All-Stars will now just be $20 moving forward. This was a PS Plus game, so if you had PS Plus, you probably already downloaded it and already own it. And moving on to the For the Free section, we'll go through these quickly. We got Heavy Metal Machines. It's a vehicular combat game out now on PS4 and PS5. This was discussed by the PlayStation blog. Games with Gold are looking, looking a little bit rougher this time around. We got Warface Breakout from March 1st to 31st. Vicious Attack Llama Apocalypse from the 16th to the 15th, Metal Slug 3, March 1st to the 15th, and Port Royale 3, March 16th to the 31st. Rage 2 is now free on PC, so go ahead and check that out if you're interested. And the PS Plus Games of the Month. Kind of weird they didn't mention this during the event, they did it the day after. But we got Final Fantasy VII Remake, but if you get this through the PS Plus, you cannot do the free next-gen upgrade, which is really weird. It's like, you gotta pay for that to some degree, which is, it, it's kind of a convoluted thing with that upgrade as well. Farpoint on PSVR, Remnant from the Ashes, and Maquette, which is the PS5 game. I actually reviewed this. It is up on my channel, youtube.com backslash game Onesis. If you are listening to the podcast version, check it out. It is also why this podcast is going up later than usual, because I was working on this review. I really enjoyed this game. It was very, um, at a quick glance, it looks like What Remains of Edith Finch and like super liminal because of the sizing and, and the way they present the story. But I think it's pretty distinctly different than both of those games. Overall, I really enjoyed this. It's a puzzle game, first person, and it has a really strong narrative attached to it in a really beautiful world. So if you're into that, I think you will like this because it's uh, pretty well made. And finally, the Shut Up and Take My Money section, a reminder that the analog pocket is probably getting more pre-orders. This is according to Polygon, Michael McWhorter. More pre-orders are coming in 2021, along with a robust bot protection at Analog Store. And again, the Analog Pocket is basically like a, it looks like a Game Boy, but it's a lot more than that. It is though $199, which is kind of expensive. It plays Neo Geo, Pocket Color, Atari Lynx, Sega Game Gear, multiple gens of Game Boy titles. Obviously the screen is all up to date. So it's definitely a really cool way to do retro. And one thing that I like about this is that you can still use the old hardware, which is cool and sort of unique to it, but it isn't actually released until May, 2021. I don't know if the next wave of pre-orders will be included and just be able to still get it. May 2021, or if they'd be like in a second run of them creating them. I'm not really sure how that's going to work out, but I'm sure it'll be stated when you go to order. So if you're interested in one, just make sure to sign up for notifications so that you can get that info. And lastly, Stardew Valley is having a board game that I believe the board game's already sold out. So that is how these things go. It's only 55 bucks, which I feel like is pretty reasonable for a board game that has like all these like elements and pieces and things. It is a cooperative board game of farming and friendship. Keep an eye out. I'm sure it'll be in stock again at some point. I actually just started playing Stardew Valley uh, for the first full time myself because I, I started it a long time ago and then I had only played like a few minutes. I finally picked it up thanks to the split screen co-op on console and I love it. I love fishing. Apparently that's a controversial opinion, but I'm having a really good time with it. More updates on that later. And those are all the stories I have for you this week. Thank you all so much for listening. Be sure to rate on any podcast services you can. That helps a whole bunch. On YouTube, be sure to like, subscribe, and tap the bell. And again, I really appreciate if y'all could go and check out my video and or written review of Cat. It is actually my first game review in like five months, and it feels really, really good to be back to writing reviews. And as usual, I will see y'all here next time. Bye.